Welcome to the Dirty Side of Leadership podcast with Ron and Kristen, where leadership meets entertainment. This podcast features stories with names and certain aspects that have been changed to keep submissions private. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Dirty Side of Leadership podcast. I'm your co-host, Kristen Sock, and I'm sitting here with co-host Ron Ward. Ron, how are we doing today? Well, gosh, I'm doing great. Doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I am pumped up about episode four. Here we are recording episode five. This has been so much fun. And man, we've received so much feedback. People are loving this. Especially, I'm telling you, Kristen, I got text after text about episode four. <laughs> uh, my coworkers annoying. I said, I think it was, um, you know, people took solace to understand they're not the only one that has annoying coworkers. Uh, also, your tapeworm story, if you oh haven't gosh. listened to episode four, you have to. Uh, it was hilarious. So we said from the beginning, we want to provide value. We want to help leaders. But we also want to be a bright spot and provide some entertainment value and give some people something to smile about and laugh about. I definitely think we accomplished that on the oh last my goodness. episode. I would say so. I listened to the playback, as I always do, to critique myself. And um, I, I can't believe that even came out of me. That was not scripted. <laughs> the tapeworm did not come out of me. The yeah, for those story of you that about watched, the tapeworm. <laughs> for those of you that were watching on YouTube or Rumble and you saw me laughing, uh, it was legit. I was going, oh, my God, I didn't know we were going to discuss a tapeworm. Oh, my goodness. Hey, I've got something else, Kristen. Yes. Something else important. One year ago today, I was on your streaming talk show, and that's when we met. Wow. Okay. I knew it was today. about a year back um, when we started on March 9th, but wow, that's amazing. It Time has really flown and gosh, we've gotten to know each other so well. And this is such a great partnership. How crazy is that? I don't know if this is good or bad, but it was literally a week after that when I called you about doing a podcast. So it took us a almost 12 months to put it together. So that, that tells oh you the kind gosh. of leaders we are. No, yeah. we took our time for a reason. There were reasons. There were, I know we kept, we were like, okay, when's the perfect time to launch? But, and then we came to the conclusion, there is really no perfect time. I always, I always say this, just, we just have to go. You just have to go and you'll, you'll make it work. You'll figure it out as you go. You have to have an outline of what you're going to do to be successful, yeah. an idea, but uh, nothing's going to be completely perfect plug and play. And if you're going to be a podcaster and you order neon signs, you want one to go to Charleston and one to go to Portland, Oregon, <laughs> uh, there's, there could be some complications with that as well. Yeah, that delayed us like two months, actually. It did. <laughs> it did. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that little detail. My goodness. Well, today's episode, episode five, is about quiet quitting. And this is a relatively new phenomenon where employees put no more effort into their jobs than absolutely necessary. Now, we chose this topic due to the relevancy and the potential negative impact in the workplace. Um, but it, it's really important to understand not only who is quiet quitting, but why this group is doing it. Um, and also something even darker than quiet quitting has come from this, and that is quiet firing. So that's for us leaders. We are finding that quiet firing is taking place. And so we're going to dive into quiet quitting, quiet firing. And again, the age demographic that is primarily taking part in this. Yeah. And Kristen, this really... Uh when we did our research, it started as a TikTok craze. And uh, as you know, when things start tr getting trendy on social media, they really take off. But um, the origins went back to TikTok. And it's generally speaking, people who are considered Gen Z and young millennials, usually people born in the 90s up to about 2012, are the most impacted, or at least the people who are participating, it seems, uh, in this trend. And uh, this has been so informative, and I agree with you. You know, we choose a topic every week, and this is getting talked about a lot, along with the great resignation. You know, we lost yes. more people in the workforce post-COVID and during that time than probably in the history of the United States. So um, I have some real concerns for our country and for employers and even for uh, Gen Z and millennials. So I hope we can bring some clarity and uh, some help to everyone involved here. 
Yeah, absolutely. Bridge a gap, a, g- a gap of really just one group not understanding the other. And um, we will definitely shed light on that today. Um, I have a short list of questions. There is a survey out there. There's numerous. I chose one. And um, basically, it's, am I quiet quitting? And I found this really interesting. And when I personally took it, uh, of course, it asked me for my email. So then I didn't get my results (laughs) because I'm like, I don't want more spam. But I did take note of all the questions that they ask and then also what the general response has been from the hundreds of thousands of people who have taken this quiz. So I'll jump into those here. The first question is, um, are you only working hours you've re- that you're required to and refusing to work overtime? So on that one, 44% said yes, they're refusing to work overtime. And, um, and I can tell you where my husband works, there is a plethora of overtime And generally, there's people that just they're salivating, waiting to work overtime. And right now, no one wants it. So there's a a major burnout right now in the workforce. The second question here is, do you purposely avoid engaging in the meetings you attend? Now, this one didn't have as much um, agreement. So this one is a little more neutral. People seem to still be paying attention to meetings that they are required to attend. Uh, But you know, when you have an employee that goes quiet, generally they are starting to disengage. So that is something to look for. This is, do you rarely go the extra mile when you turn in a work project? Do you do just what's required? Uh, This this answer, again, was a little bit more vanilla. Only 36% said yes, that's what they're doing. Are you known for showing up just on time, but never early to your shifts? This one went up, 50% said yes, just showing up right on time. I don't see anything wrong with that personally. What do you think, Ron? <laughs> uh, I was I was torn a little bit on that. I, I think I'm with you. Uh, we'll dissect this a little more, but I think I agree. Yeah. Uh, I, I still, you know, thinking back to when my very first bank teller job, I remember having a manager that said, be here at a quarter till, but we can't pay you until nine o'clock. So for me, and you know, I was naive, young and naive. I'm like, wait, that's actually not legal. But I did it, Uh, but wasn't legal. And, and, you know, looking back, I'm like, wow, that's not cool. (laughs) When when I, yeah, when I weigh in, I have to make sure it's not anecdotal because, you know, I ran a a federal law law enforcement academy. You had to have your classroom set up. Like we started at 730. But I will say this as a compliment to uh, the people that work there. We never had any real issues of people not wanting to show up and and have their class or the the mat room, the firing range. So I was proud of that, but I don't think that's the norm, to be honest. No, no, you're you're correct. Um, Okay, this is another one here. This one um, definitely had a higher weighting. Do you refuse to use your off days to play catch up at work? 77 77% said yes, they do not use their days off to play catch up at work. Again, I... I think if you can, I've talked about this in previous episodes, you should be using your days that you're working properly. You should be scheduling your time properly to where you don't have to use your days off so that you can really separate. Kristen, I told you about a a training that I did in a previous episode, but it's worth repeating. I asked the question, do you go on vacation or when you go on vacation, do you actually go on vacation? And I walk through like a week vacation in most families of how, you know, you're cramming the car or if you fly somewhere and the stress involved on the day one and then you finally get there, you're tired, you might have dinner. And anyway, I walk through a typical vacation by Wednesday, Thursday, you're dreading to go back to work or maybe you're checking emails. And ultimately, you know, by the weekend, uh, a lot of people said they take Monday off, which gives them one day's rest. Then you're back to work. So. Uh, one could argue that's not really a vacation. I know this isn't possible for everyone, but I strongly recommend like a two-week vacation if possible. I know people like to break it up. Let's say you get two weeks. They want to take a week in the spring, a week in the fall. And I get that. But for your mental health, I think the full two weeks would allow you to decompress a lot more than two choppy vacations. So just give that some thought. That's free. Right, right. That's free. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I know what a Gen Z or a millennial would say, though. That's probably their entire vacation allotment for the year. True. (laughs) So we'll have to to go into that later when we really dive into that age bracket. 
Uh, the next one is, do you skip out on company hosted events because they're held after work hours? So that one is 49% said yes. They don't want to attend a work based anything after work hours. Um, again, I, 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 I get it. I get it. Um, do you leave the office early or within minutes of getting off at every chance you can? 69% said yes. Do you avoid taking on extra projects, even if you have the free time? 52% said yes. Are you skipping meetings just because you can? 40% said yes. And lastly, do you not respond to work calls, emails, or other notifications the minute you clock out? 58% said yes. Gosh, what are your takeaways on this? Chris, and I want to go back to one. I want to get your opinion on yeah. something. On the one, do you skip out on company-hosted events because they're held after work hours? Let me tell you the dilemma that most managers have, and of course I had. It seems the workers who are pleased and they, they feel like they're a part of the team, they attend those events. The people that you want to try to integrate, assimilate, they don't show up. Right. So I've told people before, I've had leaders or managers tell me, you know, we're trying to b get a cohesive, you know, good work morale. But every time we have like a company picnic, the people that, you know, we're trying to integrate, they don't show up. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think that's the right way to go about, uh, you know, getting that solidarity. But I want to get your opinion. Oh, my goodness. Well, I really feel that in this situation, the speed of the leader, the speed of the pack and I know that in previous roles that I've had, my excitement about something, because I personally like attending work meetings and work hosted events, um, I would get everyone so excited on the team about attending it that the majority of my team would join um, at that event. And so I, I generally was able to get that going. So I do think it, it has a lot to do with how you're positioning it to the team, the value add, um, and then just the overall engagement that you do have on a regular basis will cultivate that. No, I like that. So you're saying leadership has something to do with it. Yes, absolutely. Uh, no, no, that's really, that's really cool. So Chris, and in a, in a minute, I'm going to go into some interviews and things like that. But um, people who support this, and by the way, there are people who strongly contest the word quiet quitting. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they said nobody's quitting here you know, that that was a label that was placed on by maybe another generation, that it's really should have been called work-life balance. Right. Uh, that the, let's say Gen Z, the, the age group I talked about are younger millennials, they watched maybe the latchkey kids working two jobs, working overtime, trying to get ahead, maybe ruining their mental health. Mm -hmm. And they decided, I'm just not going to do that. So uh, what your, what's your thoughts on that? Oh, well, you know, in one on one hand, I don't blame them. I think what's quite different right now is we think about at least where where I live, owning a home right now is really out of the equation for someone just entering the job market. And so what they're really looking for right now as a collective is enjoying life. They want to go hiking. They want to travel. Right. So so saving up a little nest egg to go put money down on their first home is really not a priority because it, it seems so far fetched just with the economy, the way it is right now, and then the market for, you know, the housing market. So um, it, to me, it, it, it makes sense. And, and when you have all of that so far out of reach, it's not appealing to why do you want to kill yourself for what? So I can go, you know, have the best, meals every night of the week maybe but um it's just a complete realignment of priorities yeah i i i agree and as you know i've had a change of heart i've evolved a little bit on this uh, because when i think back like my mind is geared i'm i am the epitome of the hustle culture and uh, you know, I believe, and and if you if you look at my social media, you're going to see it. I posted literally a week ago before I really was studying this about, and it's in my book. It's one of the dirty lessons in my book. It was like if you want to maximize, you know, success, you have to minimize your social uh, life. Uh, success requires hustle. So uh, you know, I'm Mr. Hustles. They used to call Pete Rose. I will uh, date myself, <laughs> but. Uh, 
I really have um, evolved some and started to see the value in enjoying life and in maybe being more serious about relationships. I don't know how many funerals, weddings, things I missed. And in my mind, now keep in mind, Kristen, it was a six and a half, seven hour drive for me or a, a quick flight. <laughs> But I remember I would always justify everything that the mission, the work mission is just more important. And, you know, as I look back, I'm not saying I could drive in all the time, but I do think that I made some judgment calls that I would have made differently if I could go back uh, in this regard. Yeah, no, I, I understand that. I was as well, Ron. I know when I managed one branch in particular, I worked Monday through Saturday for years, years. And, um, and now I look back, I don't know how I did that. Um, and then I think about the hustle culture as you're talking, this came to mind just over this past year. And over the summer, I was working for the bank full time, homeschooling my kids, a campaign manager nights and weekends and doing my talk show. I mean, I, I can't even looking back, my husband still has PTSD, from how crazy my schedule was. And so, you know, it, it felt great in the moment because I'm an achiever. I like to achieve all the time, but I was tired and I won't ever do that to myself or to my family again. So I've changed as well. I had one uh, breaking point. I was working on my master's degree. I was working in youth ministry at my church. This is when I lived in, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Charleston, West Virginia. And, uh, Every night on my master's degree from like 10 to midnight, I would work. And I was a full-time United States probation officer. And I remember it came down right at the end. I'm working on, you know, the uh, kind of at toward the end of the uh, master's degree. And I'm not a crier. I'm not a guy that breaks. Uh, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I just wasn't, I didn't grow up that way. Yeah. And I remember I had this really large closet and I used to just go in there. I had my guitar in there. Sometimes I'd just strum it, just be alone. And, uh, and I broke, I remember tearing up and I, I thought I wasn't going to make it. I, I took on way too much. Now, of course I can go back and say, you know, I finished the master's degree in December and the, and the a position opened up at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in like February or March. The master's degree certainly helped. So it, it is those uh, catch-22s. It's a risk versus reward. Right. But I got a little bit in the danger zone there. Um, and yeah. uh, I still, I still kind of cringe when I think about that, how difficult that time was. Yeah, it's good that you can recognize that. And I feel the same way. I'm like, wow, <laughs> what was I thinking? You just put your head down, you go, right? But that's really not not ideal. Not the healthiest either to pop a few tums every day, you know, something's not right. No kidding. Uh, that's what I think about is it could have gotten worse. I mean, you know, I survived yeah. it, but it uh, it could have gotten it could have gotten worse. So Kristen, um, we have said from the beginning, when you and I started talking about this, one of our goals, and it was things that we didn't see on other leadership podcasts, no disrespect intended, but we wanted to have listener engagement. And uh, as you know, we've got the Facebook group that's very active, the LinkedIn group, and then we get a lot of messages. You get messages from your uh, following and as do I. And uh, so we've got some information from uh, the social media group, but interviews. And uh, so I would like to share some information. It, it turns out that I've got about five interviews. A lot of the stuff is the same, so I'm not going to individualize it unless it uh, is something that's unique to that person. But the age group that I happen to interview, so I have no young millennials, I will say that, but it was from 20 to 23, the age group. And I got to be honest with you, it was so fascinating that I wish I'd have done this periodically on a regular basis, uh, nothing to do with the podcast, because especially when we discuss COVID and stuff, I was so intrigued to listen the way they thought, their responses, and how they viewed the world. So I caught myself, I was forgetting to write notes. I started getting just, you know, uh, encapsulated with this conversation. It was so interesting. But let me share just a little bit of that with our listeners. Um, well, I have to this, interject, Ron, because please. for everyone listening, I was ready to rip <laughs> Gen Z <laughs> and the young millennials 
a three bedroom, three bathroom butthole because I don't understand the soy boy, soy gal movement, right? I'm here in Portland. Yikes. What was that again? A three soy- what? Three bedroom, three bathroom butthole. And um, yeah, and that's that's a big one. Just so you guys know, like your average ranch, 2,000 square feet. Because I led retail settings. And man, if I had that type of that type of mentality the entire time I was a leader, I don't know how I would have made it through. But, but Ron's, Ron's bringing me back. He's had these great conversations. I've had a few as well with some of my followers who happen to be Gen Z. And and he's going to preach here. He's going to preach. Let's I'm hear here it. I'm to keep you relevant, Kristen. That's <laughs> yes. what I'm here for. Thank goodness. Me and the younger group. <laughs> um, so, yeah, this part of this is my, I guess, my change of heart, my transformation um, was... I guess when you talk to someone, because I am hardcore, like no one can make fun or more fun of latte drinking, you know, younger people than me. Like I heard a comedian talking about us going to war and he was like, you know, the MREs, he's like, do these have gluten? Uh, you know, <laughs> is that grass weed? I'm allergic to it. It really exactly. concerned me. I'm like, oh my God, you know, I grew up around tough guys. So yeah. I feel the same way you did. The point is though, we got to bridge the gap and you said it earlier and right. that's the key. And... To do that, you have to understand someone. But I did feel more compassion as I talked talk to Gen Z. And I thought, I tried to put myself in their perspective. And if you start with the housing collapse of 2007, 2008, now to us, um, we kind of understand it. But imagine if you're 10 years old to 14 and you're hearing this, it might have sounded like the Great Depression. And, uh, you know, we had 9-11. They don't really remember that much about 9-11, just hearing people talk about it. But they certainly remember the housing collapse because it sounded more like the Great Depression to them. So, so you've got that event. And then, of course, you've got one of the most significant events in world history, COVID-19. And uh, so I did add that to some of the questions. But, but let's start off. This individual that I interviewed is in another state. And um, so I'm going to. I'm going to put her kind of separate from the others that we go into, but she COVID hit when she was in the 11th grade. And she said that she really believed and had trouble sleeping. She thought it was the end of time. Hmm. Like she thought it was the apocalypse. You know, the world is going to get this disease. We're all going to die. And uh, there was no one to really reassure her from that. There was so much confusion. And that like, when she said that, it really set me back. She was almost teary eyed. She you know, she thought it was the end of time. Um, so they were given these immediate paper packets from the teachers because the teachers were not ready to go online. So they were given these packets and then you would have to turn them back into school. And I thought that was interesting. So it took them months to get online and start taking classes. But this part, she said she felt so lonely because they were afraid for her to visit her friends because she might get COVID. And, uh, of course, you know, regardless of what people think of COVID, that age group, it turns out, were not that vulnerable to death. Uh, But no one told her that. So she's thinking, me and my friends are dying. So she couldn't really visit anyone. Her family was afraid. And then I thought this was very interesting. At her senior year, she was offered the opportunity to go back to class. She walks in class, everyone's wearing masks, the seats are six feet apart. She said she couldn't even talk to her friends hardly. So the only thing people were worried about, she said, was social distancing. She went back one day and she said, my God, this is worse than staying home alone. So you were given the choice at her school, a school in Virginia, you could either continue your online classes or you could go back to school. She chose to stay home. She said she actually lost friends that she never really, they never really became close again. Like they just got so accustomed to not talking. Now, this was a positive. I thought this was interesting. She started painting and um, I'm going to give my takeaway on that. But she started painting and she's now taken that as a career, which I found very interesting. Now, she's doing house painting, but also, you know, art painting. Uh, What do you think about that, Kristen? Oh, wow. There's so much there. Are you talking about the painting? Yeah, like... (laughs) I'm like, that's a safer topic for me to talk about. 
Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I was biting my tongue through yeah, everything. And this I is know. someone's real experience, but it's just, it's so unfortunate that this group had to experience this in the first place. But um, about the painting, I think it was a great time for people to pick up a hobby. And, you know, even even people that were, she's high school age at that time, people that were working in the workforce, I mean, just even myself, you're not commuting anymore. You're not spending two to three hours on the road. Your lunch breaks are at home. You, you know, so you have so much more time and you're able to actually uh, really dive into some of your, your hobbies. And I think that that's, that aspect of it has been very healthy. I think that's the healthy part. And I, I started, I think I've told you this before, but, you know, I played guitar since fourth grade, but I'd really slacked off. And I picked the guitar back up during uh, the pandemic and started playing, which was which was really cool. Um, so I thought that was great. But a lot of her friends lived on gaming and social media, which mm. the other group that I interviewed, that's the exact same thing. So uh, we all know that your social skills are not developed when you're just playing video games and right. you're only on social media. So there was a, a real detriment there. Um, she believes now she's talking about having conversations with her friends. They want control of their schedule. And I hadn't had it phrased that way. I knew they wanted more time off, but they want to pick and choose, you know, when and, and what they do. So, so, that's what has ushered in. There's a huge entrepreneurial spirit. Now, we know social Ron, media influences You that. know what you can do? I have a great job. If you want to pick your hours, work the job I worked when I was 15 and sort hangers. Pick your hours, sit in Nordstrom's basement, sort hangers. They're always there. You just clock in, clock out. There you go, baby. Kristen, are you going to start talking about when they took your radio again? No. Are you I'm, still upset about I've that? I've moved on. You know, it was like just bringing it up and talking through it in episode one, I believe. Um, yeah. I feel like that was just really a healing moment for me. Good. So good. we're good now, but. <laughs> okay, we're going to move right on through hers. But she uh, definitely, now, she is the only one of the people I interviewed. She said some of her friends got really lazy, that COVID just made them thank lazy. Thank you for being honest, whoever you, <laughs> whoever yeah. you are. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, Wait, I have to plug a future podcast. Do I it. Am, and Ron, I, I know Ron's on the fence on this one because it, it, it can go one of two ways. But I want to do COVID, the great excuse. Not the excuse from a medical standpoint, but all of the business dealings where people's, uh, you know, business owners and franchise owners and where it's like, oh, perfect. Now we can put any rule in place and we can completely slack on our customer service. And I really want to dive into that. So um, lazy. I think even CEOs got lazy. Okay, so there's a great technique that Kristen just did. I was on the fence, but now she's already announced it. So that's how you do it, <laughs> folks, right there. Solidified. <laughs> no, I wasn't on the fence. I just thought, yeah, we got to really think this through because it's right. so controversial. And I don't it mind is. controversy, but there's people can really justify their position on this thing. So mm -hmm. um, anyway, to finalize, this is the same... Um, female, age 20, she said um, she does not feel very positive, although she's pleased with, you know, being able to paint and she's getting some jobs. She feels very depressed about the future. She feels like America is going downhill. Now, just quickly, I'm not going to spend as much time, but I interviewed three other. This, these range from age 23 and 22 to 25. Um, I think that's right. So, they were all three very pessimistic about where our country's heading. Uh, they think they don't have the opportunities that their parents had. And you said it earlier, Kristen, they can't even think about buying a house. They have to think about if you're going to move out, you better be ready to have three roommates. Mm -hmm. So, and you're right. They're just spending their money on other things. Now, some of them are saving money, but they just felt completely demoralized about the future uh, as far as COVID-19, they said they're still suffering from it. They also felt the world was ending and they were depressed and many of their friends are depressed and they do not feel that their age group has recovered from that. Although a different generation wants to just wipe the slate and go, get back to work like Kristen, mm -hmm. you know, you get back, go to Nordstrom and start to work. I, I agree. <laughs> but 
they did feel there's a generational gap there that right. that we feel they should be able to just say, okay, COVID's over, let's go do our thing. But that's not that's not how they feel about it. Now, this is going to correspond with some guidance we'll give at the end, Kristen. But they felt that this group now, opposite of the, the girl in Virginia, they felt that it's not it is work-life balance and it's not worth it because you're not appreciated on the job so why are you going to go in early why are you going to put in extra work your employers don't appreciate it and each of these people had jumped around a little bit that had a couple three jobs and they really did not feel appreciated and that's the word that came up so many times they did not feel valued or appreciated uh, they did not feel the pay was commensurate to their work, and they didn't feel a future, that future raises would happen if they worked harder. Um, it's hard to get ahead. And um, there was one of this group, happened to be a male. By the way, these were three, uh, all of these were female except one. And the male did believe, also said that COVID made people lazy, that they, they lived off the government. Why work? Mm-hmm. And uh, he thinks my, it's going to take years to get back to a place where, I guess, America is hardworking again. Um, and the, I guess the last thing was about the individual supervisors. And this was across the board as well. They felt like their supervisor didn't care about them. They felt their mm-hmm. supervisor was just trying to make money, just trying to keep things running and didn't care about them personally. And I think that's different than worrying about their work progress. Uh, This generation wants to be valued and cared for. We'll talk about that more in a minute, but that's the, that's the biggest takeaways from the interviews. And it did, it did impact me, Kristen. I softened a little when I, uh, when I did these interviews. Yeah, no, (laughs) I've been quiet. Here's the thing. (laughs) I, these are, these are all valid opinions and, and thoughts and experiences and, you know, with the, with the last mention you had, they don't feel valued. That is something where leaders, you know, we have to remember leaders went through this as well. And so the last three years, everyone's been turned upside down. And so the stresses um, for, for people, especially people that are a little older and have more responsibilities, the stresses really could be greater in, in many respects, unable to pay bills. Or yeah. maybe there's maybe, you know, elderly people were impacted and they lost family. I don't know. There's so much. And so I do feel that, you know, even though one age demographic um, really like grew up through this, even though it's only been three years, they were dealing with this during their their school and, and early college years. And, yeah. and that is very negative, uh, negative, negative, excuse me, experience for them. Um, that said, we've all felt it. And we've all had to respond to it in a sense. So yeah. for me, I interviewed two of my followers, both male. And um, and they were, I made sure to go with, um, I had one that was 34 years old and one who's 27. So I think I hit both Gen Z and millennial there. But um, they both, now this is, this is, these are two guys that are like hardworking and more, um, live in more of a rural setting. And they both basically said, we continued on our jobs, you know, we're um, out, I think one's um, out working in, in the field. Um, it's like blue collar. I believe he's a plumber or an electrician. I don't remember which one of the two, but he basically said, we just put our head down and went like it didn't even impact our industry. And in our employer didn't change the way they led us. And so, and it also depended on what region you're in. So what industry, what region of the country? I mean, the, the experiences are all over the map. Um, and so I don't know what to say, Ron. It, it's, it's just very different. I, I, feel for, I feel for Gen Z, but I think the, the main thing we have to do now is, like we always like to do, is tie it up with, okay, what do we do? What do we do? How do we move forward? Um, for managers, I wanted to move into some signs to look for. And actually, Ron, I might, if you want to take that one, signs to look for as an employer. I know there's 13. We don't have to go into them all. But, um, and then, and then really how to address it and how do we bridge this gap like we've been talking about? Yeah, I think that is, um, that's so important uh, to bridge the gap. But I will tell you, when I said I softened a little, this really, if you're a parent listening, 
one of the takeaways is coping mechanisms. And I'm not really going to go into that at the, at the end when we give some advice, but I do think it's incumbent upon parents to help teach children coping mechanisms. And part of that is the words you speak. And I'm going to give you an example. If um, your child is panicking over something, you don't buy into the panic. You stop that. Do words of affirmation. Tell them, okay, you're going to get through this. It's not, hey, this is not the end of the world. Now, I'm not telling you that you marginalize them or every little thing, but you will start to see patterns when a kid is very young. If they are overly dramatic if they start to panic and these are things that can be built you know uh, when I grew up I had my dad had coal trucks and I can remember him coming in from work and uh, a little bit different from Nordstrom here Kristen (laughs) Um, yeah he would come in his coal truck was broken down he's in the backyard working on it until midnight he's back up at five hauling coal And uh, so that's what I saw. And I saw a lot of death, a lot of things happen. So I think I had a natural coping mechanism. Like, you know, you just, we just had this attitude, we're going to get through it. This too shall pass. But I do think that parents, and this is free, this is separate from the normal podcast notes. The words you speak and your actions in front of your children is, is paramount that they don't see you panicking. And I do this in leadership training. I always tell leaders, no one wants to see a leader in panic. Mm -hmm. And I use the example, if you're on a plane and you're about to hit turbulence, can you imagine if a pilot said, "Uh, attention, pastors, this is your pilot speaking. We're about to hit turbulence and I'm not sure we're going to make it through. I would poop my pants. Yeah, exactly. I Um, always look at the flight attendant spaces. That's what everyone says. Yeah, I'm like, okay, I'm like looking. I'm like, they look good. All right, all right, we're good. Feeling, you know, I like to feel my pulse. Oh, okay, we're good. (laughs) You're exactly right. Think about it. You look at you look at the flight attendants, and if the if the even though you're bouncing all over the place, if the captain Uh goes, we should be through this about 15 minutes. You just have that trust. Yeah. So that's what we have to do as leaders, and I've been around leaders who panic, just fall apart. Um, we had a case one time where literally some supervisors wake up and they've got CNN and all this is back in the day, you know, uh, CNN's in the, in the driveway Mm -hmm. and everybody's panicked because we had, we had screwed up. Right. So we're like, Oh my God. And then I've been in situations where I've seen a, a leader walk in, everyone else is panicking. And this leader's just like, okay, let's get to work. Let's get this straightened out. Yes. There's nothing more beautiful than seeing a leader step in, yes. bring calm, bring detail. So uh, I don't know if I did it, but that was always my goal as I was never going to let them see me sweat and we're going to get through it. And we always did. So yeah, no, that was my MO as well, that it's <laughs> nothing's more of a turnoff in any regard, but then to see someone just unraveling in a position of leadership, you're like, wow, how do you respect them going forward when when they can't keep their cool? Once in a while, once in a while that someone has a day that is okay. But if it's like their MO, not good. All right, Ron, let's switch gears. We're going to move into quiet firing This is something I mentioned in the very beginning. This is something that has been born through the quiet quitting. We are seeing managers not intentionally retaliating, but we are seeing this quiet firing take place. And it's to the same demographic that we see quiet quitting. So I want to go over a few signs to look for to see if you are being quiet fired. Uh, Some of these are redundant. So I will try to skip over that. But here are 13 signs to look for. You're being left out of important initiatives, feeling out of the loop, like people are working around you versus communicating with you. People have forgotten to add you to meetings, email chains. Highly unlikely that that was not intentional. Uh, You probably were left off on purpose. A a full-on lack of transparency and psychological safety, really making you feel insecure about your work. That is not a fun feeling. Being set up for failure when you're suddenly assigned a large amount of tasks and goals, when you're passed over for raises and promotions, 
when your manager is avoiding you at all costs, avoiding eye contact, maybe they used to take lunch in the lunchroom with you at, at least at the same time, and now they're not in there. When things have changed like that, there's likely a reason for it. Um, and then it increases to the denial of essential privileges. Are you being denied paid time off? Things like that. Is your role shrinking? Have your responsibilities been reduced? Um, Ron, you'll like this one. You've been demoted. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, you've been demoted. Your yeah. boss may not uh, be pleased with you. Yeah. Hey. Whoa. Go figure. <laughs> I know. That one's no way. No way. Yeah, you might want to look for something new at that point in time. <laughs> Plus, you don't really come back from that. If you've been demoted and you're working at the same company, you're done. Like, yeah. if, if you ever want to go upward, you need to move on. You heard it here, folks. <laughs> uh, your boss giving you the cold shoulder, that's the same thing as avoidance. And you've lost access. I thought it meant like uh, like your card, your access card to the building's been turned off. I'm like, wow, well, <laughs> yeah. Really- I, that would be a sign. <laughs> but this one says, you know, to meetings and email threads, which is redundant as well. But um, yeah, not not a good thing nonetheless. And the last one, you're not being challenged or motivated by your boss, where basically your development conversations have ceased. That's that's not a good thing either. That means that they don't believe in you or they don't respect you uh, enough to, to put their time into you. That could still go along with uh, managers who are afraid of conflict, but mm-hmm. I just envision this conversation. No, everything's fine. I mean, you've been locked out of the building. We demoted <laughs> you, but everything's cool. Your new uh, office is in the basement, <laughs> and we're going to take your swing line stapler. <laughs> For those who know what show movie I'm talking oh, about. Oh. oh, man. Well, okay, Ron, um, thoughts on quiet firing and how Gen Z and the young millennials have been impacted. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I haven't done the quiet firing, but I can tell you as a manager, I've pulled perks when someone is basically not performing up to standards. As I told you before, it was very difficult to terminate someone in the federal government. But uh, if you are a manager listening, uh, of course, we always tell you to be, you know, courageous and take on these, have these difficult discussions. But I've seen managers who are intimidated by someone or They naively think if I give them extra perks, they'll like me again. They'll start to do great work again. And uh, that's contradictory. Don't go there. Uh, Pull those perks or don't give them anything extra for sure. Have those difficult conversations. But I think, you know, we've talked about uh, internal and external awareness, being intuitive. Uh, Anyone, I shouldn't say this, but anyone with half a brain should be able to see when they're starting to be pushed out. Uh, yeah. They really should. And this is where I think Gen Z, and I do hope a, a lot of parents, and I know we're going to have some Gen Z listeners, uh, you need to understand this is, whether we agree or disagree, these, this is what happens if, if you are not producing, if you don't want to maybe go the extra mile, you can't expect to be rewarded in, in certain ways. So that's a little reality check that mm-hmm. Kristen just did. Yeah. I know I have so much on that, but I'll just leave it there. (laughs) And there are amazing Gen Z folks out there and millennials out there. There are. Absolutely. I've had some work for me. I've worked alongside some. So this is not a blanket statement, but, um, but all in all, there are some things that you need to understand. And for those leading those demographics that we need to understand. And, um, you know, Ron, I know that you had listed some earlier about really what Gen Z is looking for from an employer. And um, and this is what I gathered as well from the two folks that that I sat down with um, is they want what you know, really, this is their love language is time off and um, nothing wrong with that. Right. They want time off. And if and if that comes with, you know, some jobs, we think about entry level jobs, some jobs you don't have paid time off. But if they're willing to take time off unpaid, I think that you should be able to be flexible with that within reason. Absolutely. So time off, a flexible schedule. Now this, now I'm not saying, you mentioned earlier control the schedule. And I said, yeah, you can just walk into Nordstrom. That's on the extreme end when they literally just like, I just want to make up my schedule. That's just not real life unless you own your own business. 
Um, but a flex schedule. Now, this is something that I have seen managers do. And I was flexible within, you know, I had certain business criteria I had to stay within with my team, but I was flexible. If it, if it was not a negative for the team, why not? That's my, that's whole, my whole takeaway. But I've had um, people that I know that have worked for leaders that let's say they oversaw 10 departments. And if Marjorie in accounting had July 4th off, um, Taylor over in, uh, I don't know, Taylor over in the wire transfer department wasn't allowed to take the 4th of July off. That's asinine to me. And yeah. that is someone flexing unnecessarily. Nothing will turn Gen Z or millennials away faster than when you flex and it makes no sense. And yeah. even me, 41 years old, I don't like that either. Yeah. So don't do that. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that, Ron? No, we're you and I are in total agreement. Um, I, I, um, I definitely want to get to some, some things that I think companies can do. I'm working on a new employment retention program, and um, I had the opportunity – to interview the a trainings operations coordinator for a very upscale restaurant chain. And we talked about this topic. And Kristen, you said something that I'm so glad you said. I, I never like to group people because even this person told me there are some extraordinary Gen Z people. A lot of it we know is based on parenting and what you're taught as a kid and the example set. So, um, yeah, I kind of hate and I, I feel like I did it a little bit. I'm glad you clarified that uh, we, you know, there are common denominators with Gen Z, but there's these extraordinary young people that's always out there. And uh, that's really cool. So what I want to do is give something really easy. If you are an employer, uh, these are attitudes. These are behaviors you can engage in that will help integrate and help Gen Z because Kristen said it earlier, we want to bridge the gap. We can mm -hmm. complain, we can call people soft or whatever, but it's not going to help. So, and the, these attitudes or behaviors I'm giving you corresponded with what this individual is doing at these chain of upscale restaurants and it's proven uh, valuable, invaluable almost. So this is going to be an alliteration. So it's all going to start with an A, easy to remember. If you're driving, don't write them down. You'll remember them. Um, the first one is affirmation. Affirmation. People, we said it over and over, and you heard it in the interviews. People want to know that they're important, that they mean something to the company. And I've got a section in my book about, you know, once one time someone looked at me and said, what's our vision? And by the way, this was a negative employee that I brought to my office to talk to them about a situation. So they turned it on me and they go, uh, what's the vision? So what did I do? I quoted the vision statement. And <laughs> then they go, what's that mean? And here I am backpedaling. I brought this person in to give them some corrective feedback. And I'm the one that's all of a sudden treading water, trying to figure out where we're heading. So that oh, vision. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. That That's vision statement. Say. Well, I did too, but I promise you, <laughs> I was so deep in thought that they yeah. got me for oh. a brief period. And here's the important takeaway from this is a vision statement on a company website is not enough. Unless someone feels a part of that company, I call it from team member to teammate, unless they feel valued, unless they feel a part of it, it's not going to mean anything to them. So be ready to give some affirmation. Number two is acceptance. They need to feel accepted. You can't have a little gathering with your age group and, and you neglect or you don't invite someone that's younger. They, they got to feel accepted. Uh, number three is appreciation. Be sure to say thank you. You really did a good job on that project. And for some reason, again, we will group people. That means more to Gen Z than almost any group before. So let them know that you appreciate them. Make yourself available. Have some one-on-ones. Pull this person aside. Say, "How are you doing? How are you? Um, ex you know, how are you getting along with other people? How are you doing with the uh, business? Are you catching on? Is there anything I can do for you?" Uh, the next one is you're going to love this affection. We got to keep that in the yeah, light. Yeah, I'm like, um, <laughs> can, please expand. <laughs> it's it's expressing that you care in a professional manner affection. If their cat passed away, you show that affection. We are so sorry. More like uh, empathy, right? Empathy. 
Okay. Exactly. But I that think... messes up my alliteration, Kristen. Oh, because you wanted a... A's. I think I affection, I'm a. thinking like a physical touch or something. Give I'm him like, a big hug. That goes against <laughs> yeah. so much training. Um, <laughs> All right. Sorry I messed up your A. Excuse Kristen there, everyone. <laughs> you're a, um, just affection. You know, you're, you're affectionate. In affection a, with an E. With a wholesome, <laughs> with a wholesome, in a wholesome way. Uh, uh, the next one is approachable. This age group, if, you, if they need some time and you are just not approachable, you're too busy, you're too whatever, make time for them. Um, this will help so much. And this uh, person at the restaurants, they're doing this. And I got this information actually from a pastor friend, Jason, who said they've been doing this in their youth ministry as well. And it's really helped. So this is across the board. If you can take this alliteration and get your managers to mean it, you can't fake it. Uh, this group will see right through it, by the way. Uh, you got to be sincere. But if you will make them feel valued, I hope, and I know Kristen does, we hope that we can get our workforce back to where, you know, America's thriving. And listen, when the, young, when the youngest workers in the United States feel that our country is going downhill and they don't feel hope, that is not a good sign for the future. So I hope that we can do our small part with this podcast and maybe those of you that listen, you will start to talk to younger people and find out what they need. As Chris has said, it may be individualized. Someone may just need another, a day off or they might need something else, but take time and let them know you appreciate them. Let them know you're available. And I think you can narrow the gap a little bit. Kristen? You know what? Okay, story time, because I just can't help myself. This is something I completely agree, and I love that. And this came to mind because this was done for one of my my Gen Z groups that I had. So I literally said there, you guys might not remember this, but there were jeans in the 90s called Jankos. And they were like massive wide leg jeans. And I always wanted some. And my mom was like, no, you're not wearing those. That's disgusting. So anyways, long story short, I was telling this story at work, how I still want a pair of Jankos just as a joke. And so I told my team, anyone that goes to Goodwill, because they don't manufacture them anymore, I said, anyone that can find these at Goodwill or Value Village or whatever whatever secondhand store you can find, if you find those and you come to work with them, I will give you the day off. And so they thought that was like the coolest thing ever. No one ever found any. Um, I'm sure I ended up doing something else fun for them to get a day off. But just the fact that like if you can put fun stuff out there, uh, that is age range they love it and and it's pretty cool to be able to speak their language and feel appreciated for doing so and uh, and making a point to do so that's super cool we did some service projects we cleaned the beach we worked a soup kitchen and that seemed to create it's an intrinsic reward you know um and um yeah i think it'll help a lot kristen as before we close i've got some advice for gen z if you are in the age group we've been talking about I want to give you some quick uh, takeaways, and I hope you will really consider these. Um, so here we go. Now, this is not an alliteration, so, um, but it's very important. Do they Number- all start with an A? <laughs> they do not. <laughs> I wasn't that creative. Um, so have you ever heard, you know, you got to walk a mile in someone else's shoes. So if you're listening and you're in that age group of about, you know, 16 to 25, imagine if you owned the company, if you were the owner, how would you want people to perform and try to think that way and maybe perform that way? Uh, number two, and this is huge. Chris and I've already talked about this. Try not to think of work as a bad word. I mean, we make it the worst curse word ever. I've heard people talking like, Oh my God, I got to work tomorrow. (laughs) Like it's, you know, I'm going in a coma tomorrow. Um, It's so horrible. If you will try, your words have power and your thoughts. If you would try to, you know, I used to, I I heard this minister say one time, don't say I have to go to church, say I get to go to church. If you, if you would say that about work, you know, I get to go to work. I'm going to go in and make a difference at the company. And I know that doesn't happen overnight, but start thinking of work as not such a dirty word. Right. Uh, the next one is, and we've talked about this, but understand 
Hard work will actually make you feel better. If you would really realize you're accomplishing something, it can make you feel better about yourself. Like, man, I made a difference today. I did something. Um, the next is realize that you're building a future even when it doesn't look like it. When you go the extra mile, trust me, eventually something good's going to happen. It's just the way it is. Um, whether you're a, a believe in manifesting faith or whatever, if you will put it out there, something good's going to come back. And uh, so keep that in mind. Also, take a leadership role. You don't need a title. Just start helping other people. Get an expertise that, you know, become an expert. Be the thought leader in a topic. And you start to help other people. Watch how good it makes you feel. And lastly, save some money. That company's paying you. It may not be as much as you want, but find a way to save some as it starts building up. You might start appreciating that job a little more, and you might want to apply yourself and get a better job. Who knows? Yes, I love those. And really, I, you know, the main things that I want to add on that is that, you know, you no matter how much you make and no matter what job you're performing, your confidence will go through the roof if you apply yourself. And I just think about the personal growth I've experienced, and I attribute 90% of it to you know, just different jobs. And even when I worked at a pizza parlor as a, as a hostess and then a waitress, when I had senior waitresses saying, oh, you're really good at this. And man, you feel so good. And your confidence yeah. just goes through the roof. And especially when you're in retail and you're working with the public and you get to interact and you get that great feedback, that feels so good. And so if you struggle with confidence at all, this is going to help so much as long as you apply yourself and bring your best self to work. That means be as positive as you can if you want to have a good experience overall. But gosh, and it's so good for mental health too. We talk about depression and anxiety, especially in this younger age demographic. Yeah. It is through the roof right now. If you are out working, being a member of society, you will feel so much better. You're right, Kristen. And it's hard to imagine because, you know, it's a large country, but everyone does play a small, intricate role. And, you know, uh, I grew up patriotic, so I knew, like, you know, I was doing my little bitty part to make our country better. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you got to look at the big picture sometimes as well as the, as the small picture. So, well, Kristen, this has been so interesting. I, I can't say that I laughed as much as I did of your tapeworm right? story on the last episode. <laughs> Hard to top that. <laughs> this one, I know, I know. I had so many responses. I was like, maybe we should, I told Kristen, I think I sent you a text, maybe we should retire. Like we end the, the whole podcast. <laughs> mic <at> drop. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mic drop. Uh, oh. No, I think this will legitimately, if we have our Gen Z listeners and, and managers, leaders, I think it could really help some people uh, getting this information. And I do want to thank those who allowed me to interview them and those people who responded. We did have some funny memes in our Facebook group, uh, no harm intended. But um, yeah, this has been an interesting journey as well. I'm learning stuff as we go. So Kristen, how can people get in touch with us, keep up with us, support us? Go on yes. this journey with us. I know. We need you. If you haven't already, subscribe. We are on Apple and basically wherever you get your podcasts, but Apple and Spotify are the two most popular. And then you can also follow us on social media. We have Facebook. Ron mentioned we have a Facebook group specific to this. We have Instagram. Um, you can even follow us on Rumble and YouTube if you'd like to listen and watch. So we are all over the place. We want you to subscribe if you haven't already and share us out so we can get more and more viewers. And this will just keep us pumping out episodes because we are really enjoying this and we're enjoying your participation. Yes, absolutely. All right. Be the leader you're meant to be. See you next week. The Dirty Side of Leadership podcast is brought to you by Forward Operations. If you'd like to book Ron or Kristen for speaking events, training, or executive coaching, visit forwardoperations.com. Be the leader you're meant to be.